I'm going to start off by a sort of, um, you know, just explaining that one of our presenters, unfortunately, was not able to be here in person. He had a family emergency, and he was very, very sorry not to be able to make it today. So, uh, for better or worse, he deputed me to give his presentation, which is a bit of an irony because I'm an anthropologist and he's an economist. <laughs> so I'm going to probably do a terrible job of giving his presentation, but you'll have to bear with me. And there's lots of economists in the room who will be able to help me out when I get stuck on the fancy analytics. However, some of the points he's making are kind of you know, universal and, and important, and I think I've got a bit more of an understanding of his conceptual um, uh, points uh, as opposed to the technicalities of his analysis. So this presentation is by Kiplagat Chasea from the Kenya Bankers Association, um, and he's looking at unbundling the financial inclusion gender inequities in Kenya. Um, so he discusses, you know, why, why does it, why do these gender differences matter? Um, I mean, as we've seen, I, I think I've just given that introduction really, that they, even, even when they're slight, they do matter. They do matter because women are so important as, as actors in the economy, quite apart from the inequality issues that we should also be concerned about. Um, Cross-country gender, uh, gender differences in financial inclusion, um, literacy and credit rationing do still exist, and he's going to look at these various sort of dimensions and drivers of financial inclusion to look at, at their influence on this gender gap. Um, his paper will also sort of seek to sort of look at the, the correlations between um, things like financial literacy and income and so forth, uh, mobile phone ownership with uh, the gender gap, with gender and financial inclusion. And then he's really going to be sort of unpacking that further through doing some probit analysis and uh, uh, using a sort of a technique at the end, which I will explain briefly to understand where we might not be able to explain all the gender gaps, but there do exist some unexplained drivers of this gender gap, which we need to also uh, have a better understanding of. Um, so women, are, as, he, as Kip Lagarde starts off by saying as well, that women are very active in, in the economic arena, extremely important in, in household welfare and, and also in inclusive growth, and yet um, they're often disenfranchised disproportionately relative to men and often have to shoulder more of the burden of poverty. Um, this also relates to their inequity in, in terms of access to res resources, opportunities, and outcomes. And, and, and is also related, of course, then to their access to financial services, or, albeit we've seen a big narrowing of the gender gap in formal financial inclusion. Um, but the fact that this gap exists, and, and certainly it's even larger when we look at the access to a meaningful suite of products, or for example, access to bank accounts, where we still see quite a big gender gap, um, it means that we've got a sort of an untapped opportunity there in the market. Um, so I'm gonna launch straight into Kip Lagarde's analysis, because I think he's got some very interesting um, uh, chart, uh, maps for us, really, to, to, kick, to kick off the presentation. So here, he's just looked at the um, differences across the counties in terms of the inclusion of men versus women. When we're seeing the dark green, we're seeing that women are actually more financially included than men in these counties. The light green means that they are less financially included than men, and the mid green means that the inclusion is, is roughly at parity. Um, and it's very interesting to sort of look at the number of counties where we've actually got a higher level of financial inclusion for women. Uh, particularly interesting is, is the Northeast, where we know that there's sort of um, a lot of socio-cultural norms that often do mitigate against women's economic empowerment. But here we see quite high levels of financial inclusion. The Northeast is a bit of a paradox for us as well, because we've also seen a huge growth in, in, in formal financial access in the Northeast. And I think we need to do a lot more work to understand what's driving that, and maybe that would help us to understand um, you know, why women appear to be more included in those counties. Um, his, his next map looks at financial health. Um, here again, we actually don't see necessarily that these higher levels of financial inclusion for women in these certain counties are resulting in their higher levels of financial health. Um, actually, there's an exception, West Pocot women do appear to be relatively 
more financially healthy than men in, in, in that county. And in fact, I do believe we have somebody from West Pocot in the room. So that's very interesting. Um, yeah, so again, there's a relationship between financial inclusion and financial health, clearly, but there's also a lot of variation across the country in terms of that relationship. Um, and then the third map looks at the intensity of, of credit rationing. So although women are more included in certain counties, when they do apply for a loan, they may still get denied credit. Uh, and, that, and there's maybe more of a propensity for that to happen in the case of women than in the case of men in many counties. They're either at parity or, or we see that um, uh, women, women's credit rationing is kind of more intense in some counties than others. And here again, I believe that the dark green in, in Kiplagat's maps actually connotes a positive outcome for women. So actually we see that women are less credit rationed in, in counties like Mandera um, and Samburu and Garissa um, relative to, to men, whereas in places like Kitui, um, we see that they are more credit rationed relative to men. So again, we see some sort of, um, you know, some interesting relationships in these three metrics across the counties with respect to men and women. Um, in terms of the uh, gaps in financial literacy. Again, this is quite an important driver of financial inclusion. And here you see sort of, you know, we saw in the previous uh, map that there's quite a few counties where women may be more included than men. But when it comes to financial literacy, that relationship is less strong. And in fact, there's a bigger gender gap in financial literacy overall than there is with respect to financial inclusion if you take the aggregate population, as we'll see on, an, on another slide. Um, similarly, we've also got, uh, he, he looks at the gender gaps in financial decision making. Um, again, Wajir, Garissa, Tana River, are some of the counties where um, men um, are more likely to make financial decisions than women. But we also see the reverse is the case in some of those counties in, in the West. Um, and again, this doesn't seem to necessarily correlate with uh, women's uh, level of financial literacy. So it's not necessarily the case that when women have a greater understanding than do men, for example, of how to read a transaction or calculate an interest rate, that that is also related to their um, financial, their sort of economic empowerment in terms of financial decision making. So these are just food for thought, really. They, we're not, I mean, I don't think there's a, a way really to explain these results. I just think they're quite interesting in terms of showing us the variety across the counties with respect to gender and some of these sort of drivers of, of of financial inclusion and, and markers of financial inclusion between women and men. Um, Kiplagart then goes on to look at some of the correlation between certain um, attributes like financial literacy and financial inclusion for comparing women with men. And really what he's doing here is, is taking the county data and looking at the extent at county level, at county level representation, the extent to which um, an attribute like financial literacy is correlated or is not correlated with the level of financial inclusion. So in terms of the, the chart on the, um, I also, I'm dyslexic with left and right, I have to look at my, my, my wedding ring. <laughs> the chart on the right, we see um, there's, uh, that, that that relates to women. So we see that the, the, the degree of correlation between financial literacy and financial inclusion is stronger for women than it is for men, which we can see here from the chart on the left. And we're going to be looking at this same relationship on a, a range of attributes. So chart on the right is women, and chart on the left is men. Um, uh, and, and again, you know, we, we also looked at the sort of the gap, the literacy in, in financial literacy between women and men. 50% um, of men are financially literate compared to 40% of women, which gives us a 10% gap in financial literacy. So that's a higher gap than we have with respect to financial inclusion, where we've only got a 4% gender gap. Um, in terms of uh, uh, income, um, now let's see. Okay, we haven't quite got a... <laughs> I think this is the inequality in income and its relationship to financial inclusion. So again, we see that when, we ha when women have, I guess, lower incomes, or we see a strong relationship between higher incomes and higher levels of financial inclusion, or a slightly stronger relationship there for women than we, again, do for men, but not to the quite a, the same extent. Actually, no, it's about the same extent as we saw for financial literacy. 
With respect to mobile phone ownership, we see a very co strong correlation for both women and men in terms of mobile phone ownership and financial inclusion. But again, this is higher for women than it is for men. Um, and here we find that you know 82% of men own a mobile phone compared to 79% of women. Uh, and, and so there is still also a gender gap in terms of phone ownership, as well as a strong correlation between phone ownership and financial inclusion. Um, here we're looking at the uh, gender gap with respect to sort of ID ownership. Again, we've got very high levels of ID ownership in Kenya. Uh, women, there's 90% of women have an ID, um, in contrast actually to 88.6% of men, interestingly. So men are slightly lower on, on, on ID ownership than are women. And again, we see a, a positive association between owning an ID naturally um, and being able to have access to a formal financial account. And that relationship appears to be much higher for women than it does, much stronger rather for women than it does for men. Again, not, um, it's interesting that it wouldn't be for men. I, that would be my question. <laughs> Why is it not higher for men? Um, again, in terms of land ownership, women, women are less likely to own land. 45% um, of men own land compared to 39% of women. Um, but higher property ownership is associated with higher levels of financial inclusion among both men and women, particularly for men actually in this case. Uh, but it's not, we're not seeing quite such a strong correlation between land ownership and financial inclusion as we are with some of the other indicators like mobile phone ownership. Access to the internet, again, um, is unequal. 30% of women and 38% and of men have access to the internet. Um, and internet access is positively associated with higher financial inclusion, again, particularly among women. Um, now, I think from the analysis that we've seen, what's interesting to me is that uh, these, all these drivers, phone ownership, income, access to internet, even ID ownership, seem for women to be much stronger drivers of, of financial inclusion than they do for men. And that's kind of curious. So for men, you know, irrespective of, of um, I mean, we see a correlation between internet access and, and um, financial inclusion for men, but it's not as strong. It doesn't matter so much whether they have internet access or what their incomes are, whether they're financially literate, um, in terms of whether or not they can actually access formal financial accounts. And so it almost suggests that there's some sort of, why is it that these, these um, attributes are so um, important for women in terms of their um, access to, to formal accounts? And that's a question I think maybe the audience might help us with, I don't know. Um, so Kiplegart went on to, discuss, to conduct a probate analysis just to sort of really look at the, um, the strength of some of these relationships. And again, he looked at a, a, a range of different variables, including formal inclusion, but also access to emergency funding, which is a sort of a, an important marker as well of, of financial health. And he found that, again, there's um, you know, certain attributes which are, are particularly strongly correlated with formal inclusion as well as access to emergency funding um, in the case of, of women in particular. That includes decision making, financial literacy, um, social capital, um, the, the number of I can't remember exactly what the question was for social capital, but uh, we have another presentation. And Naomi might help me out with that if she's in the room. <laughs> um, and uh, mobile phone ownership, of course, is again very, in fact, more than all the other indicators, very strongly correlated, particularly with financial, in financial inclusion. Social capital, interestingly, appears to be particularly correlated with access to um, emergency funding. Um, and I believe, hang on, I, I'm not quite sure whether this analysis was done simply for women or across the population, but we're certainly seeing a strong relationship between these attributes and, um, uh, you know, financial inclusion as well as sort of a financial health proxy, which is access to emergency funding. Um, yes, it is. It's particularly for women. Sorry. Yes, I see that now. Um, as I say, I have not had time to prepare this presentation, so please forgive me. Um, now... Uh, finally, what um, Kiplegat does is he, he conducts a sort of, um, what it's called a blinder Oaxaca anal decomposition analysis to understand the unexplained 
um, component that we have that the previous variables were not able to sort of explain in terms of um, the gap in access to emergency funding and the gap in formal financial inclusion. So um, using this technique, he finds that there are some significant unexplained gender gaps, both in terms of access to emergency funding and in terms of access to a formal account. And I think the question here, this technique is often used to identify the existence of, of norms and socio-cultural variables, which we often don't pick up in our surveys as explaining these gender gaps, um, or you know, particularly with women in, in the workplace, for example. You know, so this points to the fact that quite apart from you know, literacy, income, all these other decision-making, mobile furniture, all these other drivers of, of the gender gap, you know, there may be some sort of bias going on in the sector. There's something else going on that we're not able to explain and quantify, which put women at a disadvantage with respect to accessing uh, formal finance and also with respect to accessing emergency funding. And so I think that gives us some food for thought, particularly as financial providers. You know, where is that bias existing? I mean, what can we, what we do about that? Because these norms, social, social and cultural norms, and these forms of bias are often quite subtle. Um, so it, it's perhaps, um, but it's something that we can really, you know, think about as a financial sector as being really important in terms of gender and, and financial access. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I guess, um, uh, yes, Arada and I sort of slightly took issue with Kiprigat's use of pervasive gender inequalities, because actually, as, as we've seen across the population, there's only a 4% gender gap in, in, in formal financial inclusion. But we do see substantial variety across counties. And I think um, Tabitha and her team will be speaking to that tomorrow with the launch of the county report, which is quite exciting. The gender gap can be as much as 20% in some counties. Um, so clearly, the, it's very important to understand what is driving the gender gap. And, and, and that's why Kiplegat's analysis is important in, in looking at those drivers. Um, particularly, mobile phone ownership is obviously a, a key driver, um, as is um, financial literacy is also an important driver of, of that gender gap. Um, and in addition, I think it's very uh, important, and, 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 and Kiplerat also mentions, you know, internet ac access, which I think will be an increasingly important driver of meaningful financial access as well, especially when we're getting more granular in terms of our delivery of financial solutions. So um, uh, I think uh, on top of all that, you know, we've obviously also got uh, Kip Legut's finding that there is this unexplained dimension, which is also driving the gap between men and women in access to finance. And I think that's also, to me, very interesting, actually. And I think it does give us food for thought. Um, so I will end there. And I will, again, have to beg your uh, indulgence, <laughs> because I'm sure I, I didn't present that very well. But <laughs> Uh, anyway, we can, you can also get hold of the, the paper online and, and ask Kip Lagat questions in, you know, yourselves as well. Uh, later, you can be in touch with him. Sabel Kusimba is a, an associate professor of anthropology at the University of South Florida. So the book that she's written is called Reimagining Money, Kenya in the Digital Finance Revolution. And it's actually available at the bookstop at the IA Center. So you might want to check it out. And, I, and the video that we've been seeing um, kind of playing in the background, one of those is actually a video based on the book that Sibel filmed while she was in Western Kenya. And she's been working closely with Naomi Wanga, who is a researcher and who specializes in research on the informal sector and, and SMEs. Um, she's done some work recently, I, I believe, in, um, in Gikomba. And she's also done a bit of work in the past um, with FSD on looking at the drivers of declining financial health from a qualitative perspective. Uh, so as we get Sibel online, um, uh, the topic of her, whoops, I haven't got the program with me either. <laughs> but the topic of her talk um, is going to be on, as I said, uh, persistent informality. Why are we seeing informal institutions like Chama's continuing to persist despite the rise in, in, in formal finance and available availability of, of uh, formal financial services. So that's really what Sibel will be unpacking for us now. And um, Sibel, I think you're online. Um, so I'd like to hand over to you. Uh, oh, actually, I tell you what the problem is going to be is the slides. Uh, oh, hello. 
Hi, everyone. Hello, I'm going to start the presentation. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, this has been really a, a, a very wonderful experience. We've learned so much working together. So let me um, share the slides from the beginning. Here we are. So Naomi and I looked at informal groups in the FinAccess, and we also did a qualitative study and we worked with nine chamas in six counties all over Kenya during the months of June, July, August this year. So let's begin by looking at the financial landscape here in Kenya as a kind of ice scape. So what you see here are three different icebergs on the surface. We've got digital finance, the largest iceberg with 29.1 million accounts. Traditional banking, the smallest but the oldest iceberg with just 6 million accounts. And then we have another iceberg, which is mutual finance, which as Naomi and I are defining it, includes SACOs as well as groups. The SACOs are only about 2 million out of this 10.5, whereas the SACOs are about 8 million and something out of this. So as you look at the surface of the FinAccess, these, the digital iceberg and the traditional iceberg, they're a little bit better defined in the FinAccess. Uh, we get the names of particular products, for example, when we talk about digital products such as loans, mobile money, traditional banking products. And then when we get to the mutual sphere, especially the Chamas, we see there are a lot of different groups. There are a lot of people in groups and there are a lot of different functions to groups. But nevertheless, we don't get a lot of specific information. It's all a little bit amorphous and it's somewhat mysterious too. So we need to go deeper then. And part of the reason why Naomi and I started working together is that we both had the same working hypothesis about these groups. Uh, you know, it really seemed to us that this mutual sphere, uh, this mutual sector where social bonds and um, you know, social assets are being leveraged wasn't really distinct, but rather the mutuality of finance kind of ran through the entire iceberg when you looked underneath it. So, you know, our mutual assets, our social bonds, social relationships, social capital, are these important across the entire ice mass? And are these groups then, the informal groups that people are forming, are these really just ways that people can come together and use digital finance as a tool, for example? Are these just really ways for people to come together and use traditional products like a bank account as a tool, for example? So, so maybe mutuality isn't really a separate iceberg, a separate sector, but rather does it run through the entire set of financial pay, uh, behaviors and the entire mix of finance on the landscape right now. So, you know, if you really want to highlight then mutuality as an important underlying factor to finance in general, you know, maybe we really need a paradigm shift here. Maybe we need to get away from perhaps that traditional view where finance is a set of individual decisions and behaviors. And maybe we can ask, well, maybe financial behavior is really about groups. Maybe managing your financial life is really more of a group activity. And maybe for women in particular and marginalized groups financially, maybe financial action, maybe financial capability, maybe financial agency is something that people find and access by creating financial ties, by accessing financial ties, or by severing financial ties in some cases. So maybe we need to look more at mutuality as a kind of underlying factor for finance. 
And that's really this perspective that we bring to these financial groups that we ended up studying, a very diverse set of groups. But you know, the, the kind of underlying idea that we found here that's active across all these groups is the idea of slow finance. So it's a little bit like you know the difference between fast fashion and slow fashion. Fast fashion is like you know something you know a, a t-shirt that you just buy right away because you need a t-shirt and you need it now. For example, if I need a digital loan, I need liquidity now. I'll just go to a digital lender, right? Slow finance is now a little bit different. In other words, slow finance is like slow fashion. It's like that classic shirt that you can wear for years and years and years. You love the cut, it matches everything you own and you keep coming back to it because it's your favorite shirt. It wasn't the cheapest shirt, but it's something enduring that is gonna last you for a really long time. So these informal groups then, these chamas, they take the time to build relationships. The ideal chama grows and deepens and ramifies the strength of financial, financial assets over time that are essentially these social bonds. So people in groups, and we focused on women, although Naomi is going to bust some myths around that, but uh, you know a lot of the themes from the literature we feel still found to be at play. Social support, so spiritual report, support is very important. Flexibility in terms of helping people meet their obligations to the group, giving people more time to repay, for example, is important. Fungible contributions is important. I cannot contribute this month, but I can cook food uh, for the next funeral in our group. Um, and the importance of voice, agency, social power for women is still really important. This is, for example, a group that has visited the natal home of one of its female members, and you can see they are celebrating the woman's mother, and they will be given gifts in return. So these are age-old practices around matrilineal and women's spaces of social power, and it's so interesting to see the way that they are still important in this sector. However, it is not just social bonds that are going on here. There is real finance being provisioned here to women and men who are members of groups. So you've got different kinds of financial services that people can access, sometimes from the same group. The most common being the lumpy sum that you could receive from a, a merry-go-round but note also what we see in the fin access and what we saw in our qualitative was the growth of a more sophisticated ASCA model around giving loans, which requires a certain amount of bookkeeping and more sophisticated organization. We also see the rise of welfare and the continuing importance of welfare groups where you don't put in a lot of money, but you're there for each other in times of emergency. And notice the rapid growth of welfare across different sectors, interestingly enough, with all of the shocks that Kenyans have been experiencing of late. A very quick um, case study now, this is focused women of Naitiri, Transnzoia County. These are 22 women, they are farmers, they are the wives of the teachers, wives of teachers. The home you're looking at now is the chair lady's home. She's probably the wealthiest person in that group. Her husband is a retired army captain and her daughter lives in New York City and is the CEO of Enda Shoes. If you've ever heard of Enda Shoes, they're made in Kilifi and they're sold in the United States. Um, so I got two birds with one stone there because I, I also was able to meet her daughter. So this group is most proud of the fact that they've been together for 11 years. They have a merry-go-round of a thousand each month. They put in 200 each month in shares for table banking. Welfare is very important to them. They have a spiritual advisor who hears requests for aid from members in um it, it, and what the spiritual advisor does is uh hears those requests anonymously which preserves social bonds because it preserves the dignity and the pride of the members 
And the, if one particular member is experiencing adversity, um, she doesn't necessarily need to be known to all the members of the group, which I thought was really interesting. This group really aspires to be more financial, but they just don't have the means. They received a Nuezo loan, um, but uh, you know their business plans were never really realized. They were, had so many household consumption needs and debts that they really just used their Uezo loan to get them their household finances, um, you know, back in a little bit better footing. So, um, you know, what do we see? That's what it, that, those are what uh, what mutuals are. Um, those are what chamas are. What do we see going back to that iceberg? Well, as you can see on the left that mutual iceberg is melting. We see a decrease in the number of chamas under the fin access. And this question is, you know, are you, which, how many people are, say that they are in a chama? And that number has been going down as it has been going down for SACOs as well. And you can see, of course, on the right hand of screen, the rise of digital, uh, digital banking. Um, we're concerned about that because we don't necessarily think that this is what people want. When you ask, why are you no longer in a Chama? The vast majority of people said, I don't have any money. Or some of them said, you know, I, I don't have access. I don't know where there is one near me. So I think there is a lot of desire for to be back in Chamas and to get this sector going again even more strikingly to the point of the potential importance of group models is the relationship between chama participation and financial health now we don't have a true econo uh, sort of econometric analysis here we don't have causality established but nevertheless it is striking that uh you know the the people who are in a chama are tend to have tend to be more financially healthy, are much more likely to be financially healthy than people who are not in a chama. And that's particularly true for women. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to um, Na Naomi, who's going to bust some myths about the demographics of chamas. Now, Naomi, just so. tell me to advance. I think that's okay. the easiest way, huh? So okay, I'll great. advance, yes. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, great. So as mentioned by Sibel, um, some of the things that are, we're going to do some myth busting around demographics. And essentially when we think of chamas, we're thinking about um, these groups that are mothers, our aunties, uh, our sisters are constantly having and meeting together and interacting, whether it's on Saturday or a Sunday and um, taking over and having lunch and sharing that together. However, we are seeing that there are men involved and in having um, chamas um, so we can see that, that that's continuously. So from 2016 up until 2021, we're seeing that um, composition of having men within that, that kind of group. Um, Sibel, we can move on to the next one. And essentially also just to look at it in terms of um, who are, what is the education level of those who are involved in traumas? Um, so we're seeing that um, essentially, we would think that this would be something that would be quite um, popular among lower income earning people, people with less education, uh, but that not, is not necessarily the case. We're having people who have gone to university, people who have primary education, secondary education, being more involved in, in, in chamas as opposed to those that are the poorer population and those who have no education at all. And that is equally the same for when we look at the wealth uh, quintiles is that we're seeing it more predominantly among those who are middle um, and the wealthy and the elite section as opposed to those that are, are more poor. So uh, that's a quite, kind of an interesting shift. And related to this slide is what uh, Siebel shared um, being the reasons as to why one person would not have a chama. So essentially, if you don't have money, then essentially you then would not have the chama. So Siebel, next, please. And then um, also one of the interesting that we think that we found in the data is that uh, those that are involved in chamas tend to be essentially the, the bulk of them are uh, business owners, um, which is quite interesting. And then closely followed by those involved in agriculture and then those who are there employed. So could it be that, what is it that would um, encourage people in business to then be involved in chamas? Is it that it's, it's flexible? Could it be that it provides liquidity for them to be able to, to do their businesses? So we try to explore some of that in our 
uh, focus group discussions and one of the groups that we interrogate um, sort of helps us to understand a little bit more about this. Um, next, please. So um, related to that is also the fact that with this slide, because we're seeing that there is um, reliance on in, in investment in traumas, it's also quite predominant among uh, middle wealth uh, business women, as opposed to those that are rural food poor and, and also those in the upper um, uh, 20%. Uh, so it, it's quite similar to what we've seen with the other graph in terms of investments and who's investing in this traumas. Um, so next, please. So one of the other things that we try to get from the Finaxis data is what is the top, what are the top three purposes of why people um, save in chamas? So the biggest reason, the, the most, uh, it was a multiple uh, response question. And one of the highest responses to this question was that they use the, the reason as to why they save is to purchase uh, farm inputs or machinery for their land, um, which if you do recall, that's quite similar to what we said, we had a large population of them in agriculture involved in this. And then secondly, we do have um, another reason as to why they're taking, they're having the savings in the Chama is to be able to expand their businesses. Again, related to what we're seeing with um, having business owners as being the largest percentage of those that are in chamas. And then the next reason after that was to invest in the premise for their business, which again is related to what we're seeing among business owners. Next, please. So as I mentioned, we try to answer some of these questions. We, we, we try to look for answers for some of these questions through our focus group discussions. And one of them was done in Nairobi with a, a group of women who are, um, who own a salon and are able, who have customers come in. And uh, as women, we're aware that um, there are seasons that are high and days that there's more income as opposed to others. So what we did find with this group of women that were aged between 28 to 35 years is that, um, and commonly uh, all of them being salon women, is that they get to contribute about 300 shillings weekly. And um, it is a strict system. They do have a WhatsApp group and they have a strict system whereby the rules of the group are written on the WhatsApp page. Um, so there's an interesting use of technology among these groups. Um, and interestingly, when they do need a loan, it is one member gets to post it on the group and it's a fast come fast up basis for the loan issuing. So that's how then they apply for the loans and then preference is given to the person who applies for it first. And then there's also this idea of them being quite disciplined in, in the sense of how they, uh, if, if contributions are not made by 11, 59 PM uh, that night, then there's a penalty in card. So there's a very strong sense of discipline that we're seeing among such business owners. Um, around that that sort of thing so there's this there's the use of technology in here we're seeing this weekly contributions and, and use of technology um as i said whatsapp and also zoom meetings when they're not able to meet together for one reason or the other they're able to leverage on that technology and use that thanks sibyl thank you excellent thank you so much naomi um and so just to kind of round it and bring it home then we shouldn't over romanticize the mutual sphere. Uh, social relationships are not just positive. As we know, they can also be negative. And many, th there are, we did um, collect a lot of information about adverse experiences in trauma, particularly amongst the low income and food poor groups that we worked with. And I think that's really important. When we ask people, what makes your trauma go wrong? They said poverty. So, you know, social assets don't exist on their own. Social and economic assets always go together. People also mentioned gossiping, poor communication, and a lack of shared information or misunderstandings. Uh, and so we can see that one of the pain points with this sector is accountability, but also having the material support that is needed to be financial. Right? Um, <clears throat> fin access, interestingly enough, doesn't seem to indicate that uh, losing money in a chama is, is a big problem. This may have to do, again, with the temporality of, of chamas as being kind of long term. But there, there is definitely more work needed in terms of exploring some of these pain points around accountability. 
some of the important trends in traumas that we were able to see through our qual that are also reflected in fin access can be summarized by the word sophistication traumas are becoming more sophisticated and they're connecting as we said at the beginning of our presentation they're connecting to digital finance they're connecting to traditional finance in new and interesting ways um, indicators of formalization are happening across demographics uh, for example, the rural food poor women are the most likely, according to Fin Access, to have a constitution. And we find bank accounts, certificates of registration, and to some extent, mobile money accounts uh, being adopted by Chama groups across different uh, segments of the Kenyan population. So a lot going on there with formalization. We also have really interesting trends in technology, as Naomi already explained, her group had some very sophisticated use of WhatsApp. Um, but technology even allowed this particular table banking group to meet over Google Meet. So you might ask, how can table banking, which is designed to bring cash to the table and then redistribute it in loans during a meeting, how can that happen online? Well. Um, people uh, basically gave the amount of money that they were returning and named the amount of money that they were requesting to be given out to them. And then this particular group, which was managed by an NGO, had an NGO manager specialist present at the group. And then she was able to do about two hours of math after the Google Meet and send everybody in the group a WhatsApp telling them exactly how much money to M-PESA and exactly to which member of the group they should M-PESA their money to. So there you go, there is table banking taking place entirely through a Google Meet, M-PESA and WhatsApp being assembled there in a kind of creative bricolage there. Now this particular group also meets in person but since they started meeting through Google Meet during the pandemic, and now they've kept it up every once in a while because they have busy schedules. So technology and NGO management are giving these groups new ways of organizing themselves. Um, I think we have to be careful though, not to overdo that because according to FinAccess, we can see that cash is still by far the major contribution channel, even to these elite women with secondary who have the largest use of mobile money as a contribution channel. And elite women with secondary would certainly describe the previous group I showed where they were meeting on Google Meet. Those women were uh, Nairobi women, all of whom were employed. So, you know, these are, um, you know, aspects of sophistication and innovation that you know take resources and take money and may not be available to everybody who is out there right now who would like to be in a chama and we can also see that the chama members are tend to be more digitized than the average population so we can see that percentage of chama members using say mobile money is 92 percent whereas percentage of overall um people in the fin access in kenya is 81 percent for ex and similarly 31 percent of chama members have a pay bill perhaps they own a business perhaps they're really good at fundraising whereas only 24 percent of people overall have a pay bill so there's that tendency and that trend towards digitization as being a kind of tool of everyday life that many people who are in chamas are also getting exposed to and using Okay, and so the final trend I think is really globalization and that what that we can talk about in terms of this increasing uh, sophistication. So here's our final case study then. Um, the the uh, Paynads Diaspora Women's SACO. This group was founded in 2016, but it was based on a group of women in who are Kenyan who were working in the United States and Canada who had been meeting on, on Facebook using um, Facebook video conferencing since 2011. And it's, this is a fascinating group because their, their mental model for creating this SACO was really their mother's chamas. 
So they came together and they did um, a lot of work to register their group back in Kenya with the Commissioner of Cooperatives in 2016. They had a lot of very creative, very interesting fund um, membership drives and fundraising drives. And they now have 1600 members and about 600 million shillings in the bank at Kenya Cooperative Bank. Um, so, you know, why did these women create a Chama? Why didn't they just send money home to their relatives? Again, it's important not to romanticize the mutual sphere. Many of them felt that their relatives weren't using the money that they sent in appropriate ways. Many of them felt that they were being used by their relatives, um, you know, as a source of remittances and that, uh, you know, some of the ways they wanted to be influential in their families and in their social groups weren't really being taken seriously. So they actually created the Chama to have more control over the, the destination and the purpose of the remittances that they are sending. And their major focus has been asset building. As women, they feel that it is, that it is difficult for them given patriliny and the gender norms that uh, prevail in Kenyan societies, even in relatively well-off families, they feel that um, the gender norms in Kenyan society and Kenyan uh, families, inheritance rules and so on, make it very difficult for them to own property. So like a lot of SACOs, their focus has been on purchasing property in Kenya. So I don't wanna to take too much time because I could go on about that for a long time, but let's summarize then and you know, where are traumas heading? You know, um, I think providers need to understand that that life cycle of a trauma is very long and that long-term bonds are a goal that often supersedes particular financial purposes at, at particular times. Um, you know, technology could be harnessed to to create more accountability and to help these groups build their bonds over time. For example, a group ledger or some kind of communication protocol could give these groups the transparency that many of them want. But I think the final thing that we learned is that you know mutuality is not a spontaneous thing. It's not a thing that marginalized uh, people and women just naturally have. Mutuality also takes economic uh, uh, investment and, and the, these mutuals at the bottom really need support because as we can see, they seem to be very, very important to financial health in Kenya. And otherwise we may be headed down a road to where only elites are able to benefit from the mutuality of Chamas. And I think that's it, that's for now. Thank you very much, Sybil and Naomi. That was a really fantastic presentation and, and gave us a lot of a flavor. I mean, we sometimes, with the dry statistics, we don't always get a, a flavor of what it's really like, what people's financial lives are really like in, in practice. And they're clearly very, very rich, um, particularly when we bring in the mutual um, sphere. Um, so I would, uh, racing on now because of time, I would like to invite uh, Luis Trevino from AFI to give um, a short presentation on sex disaggregated data and its importance for our understanding of gender issues within the financial sector. Luis, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amrik. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. <laughs> yes, we can, yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for the invitation to this. Uh, session uh, has been very very interesting and insightful you know what you have shared uh, on, on on the detail on, on the kenya or what the finances is providing and the and, and the study on the, on the chama is really really insightful uh, well i will provide as uh, i mentioned uh, earlier today i am the senior policy manager on financial inclusion data in the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. For those who are not aware of the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, we are a network of financial regulators and policymakers across more than 80 countries around the, 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 the world. Uh, uh, and uh, we provide a platform for enabling uh, policies around financial inclusion, right? And, and, and well, it's really my pleasure to be here today. I will speak today about uh, 
you know, about the, the data collection and, and data usage uh, in, in, in this important aspect of uh, women financial inclusion. So in AFI, we have, you know, we have developed a theory of change, right, uh, in terms of uh, how uh, the um, relevance of financial inclusion for uh, enabling, uh, you know, uh, financial health, for enabling, uh, um, for even eradicating poverty, right? So in, in these regards, uh, especially thinking on women and on women on, on, on women financial inclusion, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, as you, as you aware you know this provides a reliable and efficient transfer of value right it uh, enables um, uh, allows to enable a smooth a smoothing of financial flows encouraging resilience right? and and setting and achieving long-term goals right and it's a catalog answer also towards additional independence as, as we have seen in the in the last session you know uh, finance is uh, one of the as, as others but it's an important catalyzer to enable Woman economic empowerment and self decision making that also uh, it's it's part of this uh, sort of, of these outcomes that we are looking for right with with this in these regards it's relevant to to measure uh, uh, one financial inclusion what is happening in terms of inclusion not only in general but uh, and not only on women but having more granularity right and understanding the, the different groups that are impacted. Uh, Positively and also negatively with uh, with finance, right? Uh, uh, and and, on this, and and specifically, women are, as has been mentioned, uh, is just the, the is half of the of the of our population, right? So so it's uh, you know primary and also uh, is the one that drives uh, in, in the majority of the households, right? Uh, it's the the the, the coessence of, of many of the households. Uh, so, so in this regards, uh, and we have seen, as we have seen, um, there is a gap, right? There, but there has been a gap since we started, uh, since you know, uh, uh, working on financial inclusion uh, and uh, measuring financial inclusion. Th th there was there started to be this conscious, this awareness of, of the gap, right? Uh, um, for instance, I, I have here some data from the FINDEX, uh, the most recent of 2021 and 2014. Uh, right now, in fact, there has been a, a, a quite positive progress, right, uh, from um, especially in women, from 58% of women uh, uh, with an account ownership in 2014. Uh, now, in the, the data from the, the latest uh, FINDEX it's 74 uh, percent right also the gender gap has been reduced right from seven percentage points in 2014 to four percentage points in 2021 even even with the with the challenges of that we lived on the on the COVID. but uh, so, so this this uh, proves that there has been you know a very um, fast um, uh, increase and uh, on financial inclusion for women, right? But still, this increase has uh, been at a, at a, a lower pace than than you know looking at what had happened with with men, right? Um, also, we have seen uh, you know the the rapid increase in in the sub-Saharan Africa continent, right? Uh, um, from 34 percent of uh, account ownerships to 55 percent. Uh, but not only on account ownership, especially thinking on mobile money, on on, on digital payments, uh, we, we have seen how mobile money is uh, really um, uh, important, uh, you know, uh, enabler of financial inclusion, right? Uh, and, and not only mobile money, but also digital uh, finance, digital payments, and uh, uh, but still there is this uh, gap uh, thinking especially uh, thinking in the in in the region uh, at, 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 uh, um, at the regional level the global level there's still a, a important gap that uh, um it, it is quite uh, also we need to to to, to, to highlight that uh, for instance in terms of mobile money the gap it's in africa it's uh, lower than the gap in general account ownership so this also indicates that there is a, a uptake, right, in terms of mobile money, but still, uh, well, that it's it's a signal. 
Of course, you know, the, the data that uh, Global Findex provides, it's uh, global, it's just for, provides uh, some insights at an international level. And, and that's why it's very relevant, the, the exercise that uh, we are discussing in this conference, the one on, on that, that they developed uh, the different authorities in, in, in Kenya and with the finances survey. Uh, because this data provides an indication, but it's not enough for uh, national national policies, right? And in this regard, um, driving national policies, it's, uh, um, for driving national policy, it's important to, to really uh, enable uh, you know develop um, uh, and uh, collect uh, sufficient data right to, to to really understand what is happening in the in in the you know in in, in our uh, countries in 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 the different in the different aspects in different groups that, that we want to, to really um, uh, impact right with policies uh, and also uh, also not only from policy makers but also from from the uh, industry participants no stakeholders so uh, in the alliance for financial inclusion we have been you know uh, very keen on 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 women financial inclusion and on measuring women financial inclusion and and since in fact uh, 2016 we started uh, there was this uh, declaration uh, we call it the nro action plan where all of the members have uh, committed to to really uh, uh, go more um, uh, Act, be more active in, in collecting data for in terms of, of women, not only data, but also on, on, on identifying policies that can impact positively women and, and women financial inclusion. And uh, we have for this, uh, for instance, the toolkit that uh, here, here described very briefly in terms of the different aspects that, that uh, um, many, many of our members have been following to uh, eventually uh, collect and use uh, uh, relevant data to inform their policies, right? And in these regards, it's important first and you know, foremost to identify what are the, the, the needs, right, of, of, uh, of, of uh, data, right? And in these regards, um, uh, demand side surveys are, are, are a very important source because they provide um, an overview of uh, what is happening right in the in the market what is happening uh, not only on on the users of financial services but also on the potential users and non-users the the, the 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 individuals and families um, uh, that are ex financially excluded and it allows to identify what are the the key barriers right to to to, to, to and, and then with that um, um it, it is easier to then identify what are the the wh where what data should be covered to to really inform this right inform these these uh, gaps and and un understand uh, understand uh, um, um, identify policies to this to to, to cover these gaps. Uh, the second step is on the defining the approach right on what kind of data and, and there are different as, as we have seen in this in this session uh, as shared by, by the, 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 this panel. Um, it's important quantitative data, but also qualitative data, right? Uh, these focus groups focusing in a specific uh, uh, group uh, of the population can can provide insights that uh, that uh, sometimes is, is difficult to to, uh, to to capture in a, 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 a with uh, you know administrative data or, or with uh, 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 you know a, a just a national survey. Going more in depth to understand what, are, what is the, the, the behind the the, the the numbers, right? The, the the data it's important. So there are different approaches. So identifying what are the objectives uh, will lead to also identify what what are the, the, the approaches on, on on the data that we, we need to, to understand what is happening in, in specific groups uh, um, of women, right? Um, also, for collecting the data, as you know, especially when you uh, start to focus on collecting more data from the supply side, um, it's important to first of all sensitize, sensitize sensitize the different stakeholders, right? Not only the regulators and the policymakers, but also the the institutions that uh, that implement right uh, the the you know, financial services and that generate the data right the, the, the institutions that report the data so the consul our consultation process especially if uh, you identify the, the requirement to collect the uh, additional data from the supply side from 
from reporting institutions, from financial service providers, it's important to, to have this, this uh, sensitization and also consultation in terms of, of, um, of challenges and in collecting and reporting the data, right? There's a need of adapting systems and we have work in the, in the Alliance in um, developing, uh, for instance, uh, a, you know, from, from the experience of different members, a, that a, a financial uh, regulatory templates, right, for reporting um, data and statistics. And, and uh, we have identified some, some key statistics that, 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 uh, and data that uh, uh, indicators that can provide uh, uh, useful insights in terms of, of, um, of, of especially women financial inclusion and, 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 and other, and another grant, and other uh, groups. Uh, thinking also about youth and uh, you know in terms of, of age um so um the adapting the system takes it, it's a it's a process right uh, uh, for especially if we're thinking uh, not uh, well first of all if we are designing a, a, a national survey like like this one the fin finaccess survey uh, it, it takes uh, it, it takes time and, and it's uh, a process that that, that requires uh, uh, Quite the amount of resources, but also eventually collecting data from the supply side um, also requires uh, an investment, uh, not only from the regulators, but also on the reporting institution. So then it's important to have this consultation process and, and eventually adapt the systems. And we have seen with in the experience of our members in, in, in this journey of, of enabling uh, more useful data that uh, um, it is really required to, to have an investment in, in terms of uh, uh, get, getting more uh, systematic uh, um, processes for collecting the data, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the first approach and, and at the beginning, uh, uh, policymakers um, collect data with uh, especially financial inclusion data that is not, uh, that, that, you know, in, in, in many, many jurisdictions are, is not uh, under a, a direct mandate of, of uh, for instance, of a central bank to collect data on customers, of, it's uh, it's mandatory to collect data on the on the on the health of the financial institutions, but not on the customers. So so it takes time to adapt the systems, right? To 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 require the additional data uh, more in terms of the of, of what is happening with the with the with the users of, of the financial services. Uh, but uh, the investment in, in, in getting more automated, uh, fun, uh, you know, data collection systems, it's worth it's worth uh, worth doing because it enables uh, it lowers at, at in, a, in the long term uh, lowers the cost of collecting this data and also it provides more insightful data not only for regulators but also for the industry from the from the financial service providers, right? And and we have seen also in the case of Kenya that, uh, for instance, the central bank we know that. They have invested in in, uh, uh, in uh, enabling the electronic data warehouses, right, to collect uh, more systematic data uh, with more granularity and and and, uh, and, and enable more more uh, um, more insights, right. Uh, then uh, you know uh, obviously this this has a process of um, uh, ensuring the quality of the data, right. It's it's essential to have. Um, um, to enable uh, data that is timely, that is uh, complete, that is uh, reliable, and, and that is relevant, right? Uh, so we have ensured from the beginning that is relevant because we have gone through the through the needs and the data needs and the objectives we have. But but it's important that when we start the process of collecting this data, we really it's data that will be useful, right? And uh, the analysis and the usefulness also implies a process. But uh, and at the end, it will uh, um, allow to inform inform uh, the 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 policies, and also it will inform the the the, the industry, right? In if when there are gaps, uh, and uh, for instance, in terms of of um, I mentioned about demand side data from like like the ones from. From the the surveys, the, last, uh, the national surveys, and also focus groups, but but supply side data and, and the importance of supply side data, it's 
the fact that it provides uh, it focuses on the on the actual users of financial services right the demand the, the demand side data provides us with a vision of where are the gaps in the in the in the in the whole uh, market right in the whole ecosystem where, where, where the individuals the groups that are you know are excluded uh, the, the barriers but but the supply side data provides what is uh, how is the, the behavior in terms of of the users of, of these financial services the ones that are now included or that we we argue that 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 we we, we see that are included the supply side data can can uh, uh, allow us to to understand how deep they are included right if uh, uh, and and then that, that's the reason to really go more in depth in the in the data collection right because it allows to understand special especially thinking on men and women um what what are the 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 trends what are the if there are some seasonal seasonality uh, in the in the in the behavior of of, of using loans in the behavior of uh, savings to understand how deep are this for instance the the balances in terms of savings uh, if, if there's a difference between men and women saving right the attrition right of the customers uh, how how what's the duration of if, if, a, if a customer is a long-term customer of, or, or it's just uh, an occasional customer, right? So th this, this is the-, the Lewis, hi. Supply side data. Yes, Lewis, yes, thank you so much. It, this is very, very interesting um, presentation um, on, on the data. The, um, our issue is that we may not have time for the panel discussion, um, and we probably just haven't quite left enough time for this presentation. So I'm wondering if you can conclude and we will of course circulate the presentation to everybody so that they can read it later yes of course thank you, uh, thank you. yes of course so so I just just uh, uh, two slides more that in this one I provide the overview of of the data uh, cycle right uh, starting with the uh, especially uh, the, uh, in terms of segregated data with demand side data going more in depth into the into uh, details on the on the users of of financial services with supply side data, right? Uh, adapting the systems um, and, and uh, having a consultative approach, but and also uh, collecting the data uh, relative to, for, for instance, the, the gender diversity at the financial institutions, at uh, financial service providers, to understand also the social composition inside the institution, right? Because that also can provide, uh, can be a trigger of um, uh, eventually uh, enabling more equality, right, in terms of uh, generating new new financial products, targeting women, etc. Um, um, yeah. So finally, I want just to, to mention two two case studies on on the on the on the usefulness of use of data. Rwanda has been very active on, on collecting this data, right? They have developed their their electronic data warehouse. Uh, recently, they developed a, a data science team to. Um, focus on the on the big data that that they they, they now re, um, uh, collect from from the, this electronic data warehouse, but they are not uh, that they were not analyzing in, in in all of the the potential that that, that can be, and now they are uh, um, about to to uh, they are uh, developing some dashboards and reports on that right on on, on how are they on, on key key insights of uh, gender and women financial inclusion. In the case of Mexico, they also have been focusing for many years in, in enabling more and in collecting more uh, sex segregated data. And with the with the with the data that they have collected, especially on loans, and uh, um, enabling uh, even uh, um, adapting and, and uh, going having more insights in terms of their of uh, credit risk and, and risk management, they have been uh, even. Uh, able to uh, develop policies like like um, lowering the 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 capital requirements for a uh, woman-owned loans, right? But because there's a further evidence that uh, in, in the majority of the of the woman loans have a lower risk than compared to men, right? So um, these are some of the examples, and, and well, I would be happy to discuss uh, later. So th thank you so much. Uh, Lewis, thank you so much. Um, actually, I'd love at some point I'd love to hear more about those case studies because they sound particularly interesting from Mexico and Rwanda. 
in terms of how um, you know those countries have really grappled with this sex disaggregated data. Um, so we could maybe pick that conversation up at some other point. But thank you so much for, for that very um, important presentation because clearly data is not just about fin access. I mean, Lewis was really bringing across the sort of whole range of, of data collection tools that, that we should be leveraging to create strong frameworks for gender analysis. Now, I'd like to invite um, Tamara Cook, our CEO, um, FSD CEO, to come and moderate the next panel, the le next and final panel for today, which is um, the panel to discuss these presentations on gender. Um, please could Radha and uh, Rosemary and Mr. Mwangi also please come to the stage. Um, we have the honor of being the last panel, the only one standing between you and the cocktail Lucania announced, which might be the only reason we still have people in the room. I do hope we still have people online who are following us. And, and just a shout out to those who are online, we really are seeing your questions and loving them. Um, first question for this panel is going to um, come from the online group, so please do be sending those in. Great. So we'll get right to it since it's, um, we're running a little bit behind schedule. Um, I'm joined by three fantastic panelists today. Um, and I'll, I'll introduce them as I ask each of their first questions. So, Mwangi, um, who is the CEO of Kenya Women Finance Trust Microfinance Bank and has been there for more than 20 years, um, really serving women. Um, I'd love to start with you. And so, I, um, Kenya, KWFT has been a major driver of financial inclusion for women, including your leadership in joining the United Nations Global Compact, and I hope a lot of you saw our annual lecture from the CEO of that last week, as well as signing into the women, women empowerment principles. So given your deep outreach into peri-urban and rural areas, what do you see as the key barriers for women and the women's market? Thank you, thank you very much. And um, first of all, I'm very honored to have been invited to this forum and um, I've been participating alongside other very able Kenyans in making sure that the issue relating to women financial inclusion is put on the table. And um, I work for an organization called Kenya Women Microfinance Bank, which purely focuses on women issues. And women empowerment from an economic angle is very, very key. Uh, just before I go to your, the barriers, I would like to say that um, women financial inclusion has been very trivialized in, in this country. It all boils down to giving women services. And I think that's what we are talking about here today. But the issues are wider than services because women need to be included in decision making. Because we all assume women don't know what they want. We assume we know what they want and they have no role and they have no voice in what is going on. So as an institution, we operate mainly in the rural area because we believe that women who are excluded from the financial sector, mainly a majority of them are based in the rural area. So 80% of our operations are in the rural area. We are in 45 of the 47 counties, and we work with about 800,000 women households. And we do not discriminate men, but we use the woman as the entry point to the family. And when you think about financial inclusion, and then more so because we, are, we have subscribed to Global Compact and Women Empowerment Principle, we believe that women should be given a voice, not only in being served, but in, the, in owning the institutions that serve them. And so for us, 75% of the company is locally owned, and 67% of that locally owned portion is owned by women. That's where we start women financial inclusion. We don't start it at service. And out of our 3,000 employees, 55% are women. And out of our management, 60% of our managers are women. So now at that point, you start talking. Two thirds of our board members are women. The top leadership of the board is a woman. So it's an issue of dealing with women issues in a holistic way, not in tokenism, not saying, we want to come up with programs. We want to have initiatives that are able to address women issues. So it is an issue of focusing on women empowerment, but from an economic point. Because a woman who is economically empowered 
is empowered. Is empowered, she can make decisions, she can show the direction, she can be able to participate at the family level, at an economic level, and at a community level. So for us, we have subscribed, subscribed to the Global Compact, and we are members, and we have, we have taken the 10 principles and incorporated them in the way the institution is being run, even in the policy level. And we are also subscribed to the seven women empowerment principle, and we report regularly to the UN based on it. Not because we must, but because we want to benchmark with the rest of the world. So what are the barriers towards women financial inclusion? Uh, I'm a practitioner, and I am on the ground, and I talk to women that we are on the ground on a daily basis. One of the biggest barriers is financial literacy. And the issue of financial literacy needs to be addressed on a daily basis because women who do not, who are not financially literate, it's not the issue of interest rate, but even understanding how to manage their business to differentiate between profit and turnover is very key. The other issue is general literacy, especially when you are working out in the rural areas, you are out there, you find the general literacy of women is a little bit more than men. Then there are inherent cultural biases that have been there since time immemorial where women are deliberately excluded. You see, when we talk about women inclusion, we also should talk about deliberate excluding women. And I keep saying any good institution should do what is naturally correct. That is include women. Whether you are a corporate, whether you are in public service, women should not be given one third of the position. They should be given 50% of the positions. That tokenism, the tokenism that we have been going through, it is not only in the financial, the financial sector is where we find it. In fact, I keep saying that deliberately, the men use tokenism to oppress women. And I keep saying that in the rural area, to oppress women, you use the three Ps. The three Ps are, she's permanently pregnant, poor, and powerless. That is, those are the three Ps that I use. And so, if we can address poverty issues and provide economic and support to women, then they are able to judge the level of the family they need to have, and they will have a voice. I think that's what we do, and I would say the access to products, cost of serving women in the rural area, those are other barriers. These are barriers that as an institution and as a country, we can be able to overcome. But we have to make deliberate decisions as a country and as a sector to actually put women at the forefront of decision making and financial inclusion. Otherwise, that's what we do for a living. And I have done that for over 26 years and I have no apology for it. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership in that area. I don't think any of us are gonna forget those three Ps, which are different perhaps than the three Ps we're used to. Um, let's move to you next, Rosemary. Rosemary is the head of social statistics at the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics and has also been working for more than 20 years in the statistics area. Um, as you, We've just heard a really interesting presentation on sex disaggregated data. And so my question for you is how could better sex disaggregated data, gender aware data, at the macroeconomic statistic of, of macroeconomic statistics contribute to our understanding of women's economic empowerment? And specifically, which um, macroeconomic statistics would be most illuminating, especially for policymakers? Good afternoon. Uh, I want to say that I've appreciated to be in this panel this afternoon and uh, to be part of those that are giving enlightenment on the issue of women economic empowerment. Uh, given my background of providing statistics, uh, official statistics that are used by the government to plan for development. All of us know that our population is half women and half men. But then, when we look at statistics, we realize that the contribution of women is less. Not because they contribute less, but maybe because we don't measure properly what they contribute. So I want to say that I appreciate for being here, and I also want to appreciate the fact that the Fin Access Survey has provided for the first time information 
uh, on financial inclusion uh, from national to county level for the first time. And therefore, we appreciate uh, this particular um, direction that we are taking as a country. Um, on my part, uh, I want to say that we have demand side data, some adequate data on financial inclusion and on economic empowerment for women. But then, the area that we are lacking in, in this country is the macroeconomic indicators and mainly the supply side. That is, the sectors or the players that are providing uh, financial services, we do not have information. For example, the kind of data that we would be happy to have as KNBS and as a country would be in the area of, for example, gross domestic product. Is it possible to disaggregate it by male, female, or women, men, so that we know, since our population is nearly half men and half women, what is the contribution of men and women in terms of the size of our economy? Um, in terms of interest rates, we know that there are products that women access from the informal financial service providers and those that are accessed in the, in the formal. But a lot of times, the one that is accessed from the, from the informal have higher interest rates. It's a gender issue. Um, the other information that we do not have is about loans. Can we be able to disaggregate the kind of loans that are provided by the banking sector by sex? Um, the other one is the non-performing loans or the ones that are overdue. Is it mainly the women that have got overdue loans or the non-performing loans or it is mostly the men by age group? Um, leadership and ownership of the micro and small enterprises and the Yes, what sort of leadership do we have? Do we have women making decisions? Do we have women uh, owning or men? And then, of course, like the savings and the deposits, what is the proportion of those savings and deposits in terms of men and women? It's a gender issue. Uh, in terms of employment and earnings, it's a macroeconomic uh, kind of statistics. And that is uh, information that we do not have in, 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 in full. That could give us some direction in terms of um, supply side data for planning, for economic empowerment for both men and women. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. And yesterday afternoon, um, those of you who were here, you heard the regulators, some of the regulators talking about the potential of sex disaggregated data on the supply side. So I hope that what the, that conversation be, can be connected with this um, ask and we can see more supply side um, sex disaggregated data coming. Rada, let's move to you. Um, and Rada is a research fellow with Institute of Development Studies at the University of Nairobi um, and um, also serves on the Program Investment Committee for FSD Kenya for full disclosure and has done an excellent job on that. Her term is coming to an end soon, sadly. So um, we've seen that there's quite some variation in the gap in inclusion between men and women across counties, especially in Kiplingat's um, presentation. So I'd love to hear from you what you think might be driving some of those variations based on the research we saw today and research you've done on your own. For those of you not familiar with Rada's research, she's done a quite a bit on banking regulation, banking sector, digital credit, um, and re regulation. Rada. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Central Bank of Kenya and KNBS and FSD Kenya for inviting me today. It's actually really nice to be on this panel. I feel like I'm connected to each of the presentations. My first um, work in Kenya after I finished my PhD was actually doing uh, a, f a survey, fun a study funded by AFI for the Central Bank of Kenya on data gaps. And actually, at that time, uh, that that uh, made a 
very strong case for sex disaggregated data. So it was kind of nice to see that. And um, you know, Kipla Gatt is a good friend, and then Siba Kusimba has actually given a lecture in my class, and Naomi is one of my students. So it's it's really nice to be on this panel. Um, I think for me, one of the most surprising things um, on this panel on on uh, the the first Kiplagat's paper is actually uh, some of the, the dark green areas. So I think we should actually celebrate that. And even if you link that to the AFI presentation, Kenya's financial gap is much lower than Africa-wide. And so at the gender gaps, so actually, we have made good progress. So whilst we should focus on the barriers, I think we should actually also uh, kind of celebrate some of these dark green areas. I must say I found some of them quite surprising. I think uh, especially some of the countries like Mandera. Um, I actually think I'd just be conjecturing to say why those counties are higher than other counties. I think this does call for some sort of, again, a deeper dive into more qualitative. I think the really interesting things were two things, that the gap in literacy is higher than the overall gap in financial inclusion. So as Mr. Mwangi said, I think that's something we really need to focus on. But what was even more interesting is that the gap in decision making, women's decision making, was even higher than the gap in financial literacy. So it kind of means that even financially literate women are less involved in the main financial decisions in the house. Um, so I think all these kind of combine to, to give an answer to partly why or why this uh, gender gap has gone down but is still there. Great, thanks. And, and as you've referred to one of the papers, um, I'd love to hear from the other two panelists. Were there any surprises as you were listening to the presentations today? Maybe we'll start with you, Mwangi. Anything you saw that you were thinking, ah, that, uh, that wasn't what I was expecting based on your information? Thank you very much. I think what, um, what, what was presented, you know, told the story the way it is. In fact, what I, I had never conceptualized is rapidly moving in that direction that it is, is the issue of chamas. Because we use chamas because women do not have access to securities, that's collateral. So the, what we use is, as an institution, we use social collateral, where they guarantee each other and they start out for each other. And because we serve not totally the bottom of the pyramid, but the near bottom of the pyramid, the shift that chamas are getting more effective in the middle, middle level, that worries me a little bit, because it means there is a major shift. And the, the decreasing popularity of chamas in the itself tells us that Either the market is shifting, people are getting more individualistic. So then in, in, it means then as we finance women in future, then we may have to start thinking about them collateralizing their own credit rather than using the Shama approach. So that, 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 that sharing was very incentive and, and it tells us a story about where as an institution we need to be going. But that also puts questions whether are women now accessing more security? Do they own that? Do they, can they be able to go to the bank and give collateral? Or are we still having the, the, the biases where women have no access to securities that can be used to borrow you know, capital from the, the banking sector? So those are issues that still need to be dealt with. But that shift is a little bit worrying, and we need, we need to think exactly what is causing it. Thanks. Rosemary, any surprises or anything that you wanted to highlight from the presentations today? Well, just something small. I, I was surprised to see that uh, the, 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 the membership that is uh, involved in Chamas, are more, they are using mobile money uh, accounts more than the average population. And they are also, I realized that we also have very learned people that are in Chamas. Uh, at first, I thought it is maybe the average, um, maybe the primary school or those who have not gone to school who are in Chamas. I was surprised to find uh, a very high proportion of those that have got tertiary education. Thank you. Um, back to you, Rada. I think what, 
I think what would be useful to see here is not just to focus on the recent drop in charm I use, because when I look at the FinAccess data 2013, it had dropped dramatically use of savings groups, and everyone's like, oh gosh, this means formal finance is replacing informal finance. Then 2016, it jumped again. Then 2019, it dropped, and now I think it's dropped. So I think the linkage to the economic and the, the broader, you know, the demand and just the, the kind of the multiple shocks we've experienced in the last um, f five years, I think explains a lot more about the drop in savings groups rather than the kind of people becoming less um, mutual. Um, yeah, so just to add to that. One, one of the things that we've always um, made a point about when we're looking at the FinAccess data is you know, there's, it, for those of you familiar with the uh, access strands, there's the informal only, which is actually a very small percentage of people who only use informal finance. What's interesting is how many people use informal finance and formal finance. And so what, why are they, what, what is the value they're getting from both? And, and why do they continue to choose to use both? And I always ask formal financial sector providers, what can we learn from the informal finance? Um, solutions that are out there. Radha, let's stay with you on this Chamas. Um, in, in Sybil's uh, presentation, she was looking at, or actually I think it was Naomi, she was showing that those in Chamas are more likely to be financially healthy than those not. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to hear any reflections on that finding, um, and again, not to speculate, but what could be some of those drivers? So I think I'd like to link that to your other question about how formal and informal have been intertwined. Um, I think some of this work actually reflects on like other work that FSD has done, like Susan Johnson's work on the Rift Revealed, is the issues they mentioned as well about negotiability. And I think if there's one thing that formal financial use uh, providers can use, learn from informal finances, trying, uh, and especially some of my recent work on digital credit has shown, is what people want is this negotiability. Um, and I think it's uh, almost not surprising that people who are in Shamas are more financially healthy because uh, that's just one way that people then feel less left out because the financial health questions in the FinAccess are like, you know, uh, linked to that. Like, uh, and I think uh, one of the other really interesting things that came out of the Chamas, particularly the, the data on that paper on uh, this more formalization, was this really interesting concept of the, uh, like asking people their needs whilst preserving their dignity. And I think that's so important because I think that's one of the reasons why um, you know, digital credit has been so problematic in the last five years is it's people almost use the digital credit thinking it's anonymous and then realize it's not preserving their dignity. So I think my two takeaways from that is negotiability is part of the reason that people still really want to use Chamas. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, trying to ensure that when we're providing this finance, uh, it's, it does preserve dignity. That's great. Um, Mwangi, let's come to you now. Earlier this morning, we were looking at um, a, an interesting index, and one of the questions that was looked at was, are financial s services meeting people's goals, meeting people's the purpose or needs that they have? Um, as we think about finance, nobody really wakes up thinking, I'd really like a loan. It's about, what do I want to do with that money? And so as we think about um, many different ways of, of life, but the sustainable development goals are potentially one way of thinking about what are the needs that people are trying to achieve with um, financial services. So I'd love to hear how Kenya Women has really thought about the sustainable development goals and really sought to help um, your customers meet um, and progress in those areas. Th thank you very much. Uh, you know, as an institution, what, what we do is um, we, we are driven by a strategic focus, and uh, our direction is mainly we look at the triple bottom line of approach. That is, we look at social impact, that is people, we look at uh, planet, that is environment, and we look at profit or incomes. 
So what, what then we do is that for all our services and product that we generate, we try to address the people first. So we ask ourselves, as an institution, a financial institution, are we being a good corporate citizen? And because we are looking into the whole area of financial sustainability, you know, sustainable financing, you know, can we be able to finance our customers in a way that we leave a positive impact in their life so that they, we are not only using the customer to make profit, but we are also leaving them empowered and improved. So social impact becomes one of the key things. And, and under social impact, then we are able to address uh, the strategic development goals number one, six, to six and 11, 16 and 17. And, and deliberately, we look at that. And that in itself is put in our policies and our procedures so that everybody who joins the institution knows that. So if you come up with a product, then it should be able to address social impact. And we look at it and we are able to report on it. Then we, we also look at the environment. What are we doing to the environment? Are we coming up with products and services that are harmful to the environment? Are our customers destroying the environment? If they are destroying the environment, what do we need to do? If we look at the issue of cooking, because women are generally the ones in the kitchen, how do they cook? If, can we do it in a way that they do not cut trees? Can we bring in the issues of biogas? Can we be, bring the issues of renewable energy? Can we bring it in a way that they are more or less destruct? Because women will cook anyway. But then can they do it in a way that is as destructive to the environment, both in the household, where we are dealing with internal air pollution, and externally, where we are destroying the environment. So we look at it and come up with a product that can be able to address. And that we are able to address about four strategic uh, sustainable development goals based on it. Then we look at now profit. When we talk, we, we, our mission is to partner with women in creation of wealth. But whose wealth are we talking about? On one side, their wealth. On the other side, the institution has to make income. But you must look at then how are you leaving these customers? Are they improving their lives? And you develop products that can be able to address. And in that, we are able to, to deal with the 17 SDGs. And even as we report to the UN and report to our board, and, and we also are accountable to our customers, then we are able to deal with the issues that not only are profit making for a financial institution, but you become, you, you, you are engaged to become a good corporate citizen, and at the same time, you are pursuing the, the sustainable financing. And for two years in a row, we have been voted as the number one in sustainable financing within the banking sector. And, we, and, and it tells us that that's the direction to go. So, for example, we provide capital for business, we deal with agriculture, but agriculture mainly for food security. We look at water and sanitation, avoid women traveling long distances looking for water because that's what the work women do, so that they can be released to, the, to, do, to do business. Don't ask me where men are when women are looking for water. That's a discussion for another day. Deal with renewable energy, cooking, writing. At the same time, deal with rural housing, because rural housing is a key issue that is destroying this country. And then in the end of the day, when you do all this, then you are able to curb the rural urban migration because people migrate from the rural area to the urban areas looking for opportunities that are not there anyway. So that's how we, we deal with the SDGs. Yeah. Great, thanks. Rosemary, let's come to you. I'd like to do a bit of a public service announcement. Rosemary has been involved with some very interesting um, research that's, that's been released, um, including the um, Women and Men Facts and Figures 2022, um, really interesting um, data in there, and also a time use survey on the amount of time spent on different forms of paid and unpaid work. So as you think about these two um, resources that you've been involved in, um, what do you think the gender division of labor and women's economic empowerment is contributing to the gender gap in financial inclusion? Uh, uh, thank you very much. So recently, we released uh, Women and Men booklet uh, which provides information on the facts and figures about the situation of men and women in our country uh, that ranges uh, from population, that is demographics, uh, to education, to financial uh, use, financial access and use, and even uh, poverty. 
So uh, this booklet uh, was giving uh, is giving highlights on the situation of men and women. And uh, in this context, I would point out uh, uh, one of the statistics uh, about participation of men and women in economic activity, uh, that is labor. So one of the statistics there is showing that um, the proportion of women that are involved in paid employment is lower than the proportion of men. And then for paid apprentice and paid volunteer, the proportion of men is high. So uh, the implication uh, for women economic empowerment and inclusion is that if a man, if more men are in paid employment than women, if a higher proportion of men are in, vol uh, are in the paid uh, volunteer and paid uh, apprentice, and then um, the converse is true for the women, then it means uh, the women are not uh, getting uh, remunerated, and therefore they may not even find their money in the bank. So they are not financially included because in their participation within the labor force, um, they are not in paid employment. And then you find that the women are contributing uh, family workers or they are, they are doing certain things that maybe even they are paid in kind. So it disadvantages them in terms of being financially included. So that is one of the findings that we saw in the women and men. The other uh, statistic that we published in the women and men was about um, the priority uh, of, of, of any, whenever the woman has money, what is their priority, the priority need. And I think that was from the fin access. And we realized that the first thing that a woman would want to do is uh, to put food on, the, food on the table. But the priority for the man is to buy land, to expand their business, and to educate themselves. Now, that one is a gender issue, and uh, um, it, it means that uh, over time, the woman is disadvantaged. So within that women and men booklet, which looks like this, uh, there are very interesting statistics that shows the divide and the differentials uh, for various um, dimensions of development uh, between men and women in our country. And uh, it is in our website. You can check to see the details. Then there is this time use uh, survey that was done in 2020. And the main reason why it was done was to be able to quantify the amount of time that men and women are using uh, for unpaid care work. Now, when there is unpaid care work or any work, it means that uh, we do not quantify the value. And therefore, the country is not able to estimate the value of how you are spending your time. So the reason for this time use uh, survey that was done was to be able to quantify properly um, uh, the, the, the time that is used for paid and unpaid work. And in that manner, then we are able to properly um, quantify um, the invisible, uh, actually the unpaid work is not visible in the economy. And therefore when we are measuring our GDP, we are not able to measure properly. And now bringing in financial inclusion. If something is not measured, if something is invisible, then uh, you are not even able to, uh, to put value to it, and you are not able to quantify, you are not able to bank it, whether in the formal or in the, in the informal uh, financial institutions. So it's a very important study. The results are not yet out, but uh, before the end of the year, uh, these results will be, will, be, will be published. So that is uh, the much I can say about the time use and the women and men booklet. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm sure we all um, look forward to going through this little booklet and also seeing the time you survey when it's out. So let's turn to some questions. I understand, I think, I don't know if we've got any online. Jackton, do we have any questions available online? Nope, nobody's listening anymore. They weren't promised the cocktail, right? <laughs> Great, um, do we have any questions in the audience? Either for the panelists or for the um, on the presentations. Yes, there's one there. If we could get a, a mic right here. 
And please say your name and institution or um, university. My name is McKenna from uh, UN. And um, <clears throat> mine is um, to Mr. Mwangi. Uh, I mean, we've seen right from the beginning that uh, women really don't own land uh, much as the men counterparts. And uh, they are the ones, especially in the rural areas where it's your focus area, where the peop they are the ones who actually plow the land, they work, uh, but the land is owned by the men. Uh, therefore, again, they may not really have a say on the proceeds that come out from, from the sale of the produce. Uh, I don't know how, what have you been, what have you done so far to enable women to own land uh, so that they are empowered and therefore, uh, you know, they have a bigger voice, as you've said, yeah, moved out of the, 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 the three P's you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that question. And f first of all, the you know the, the the big the picture of women disempowerment is a national issue. It's not just at the family level. It's 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 bigger than that. It starts from the political angle where we don't vote for women. You go to parliament. We can only have one third gender gender maneno. We don't talk about fifty percent. So this whole thing is all over. And by the time you get to the family level, it only accelerates itself. And I know a lot has been done by government to say even our daughters can be able to in, inherit land from their fathers. But you see, cultural issues are there and they are very oppressive. So what do we do as an institution? What we do is that because we have been doing this business, we have been, Kenya Women has been there for 40 years. What we argue women is that you cannot be empowered unless you are able to be economically independent. That's the issue. And we are talking about women at, in the rural area. We are talking about women at, in the cities where women should even, when you buy a property, put it in your name too. I don't know who said that two shall become one and the one is the man. That has to be overcome. And, and, this, and, and we can talk about the rural women, we, but even professional women repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So what we do is we educate women, we give them input, we do not remove them and you know, try to beat them against their husband, but we teach them that you should be able to deal with your financial issues independently. And we talked about mobile phones today, we said, that women need access to mobile phone. When we introduced mobile banking and people accessing their account through the mobile phone, we discovered that the phone belonged to the family and the family was the man. So the first thing we did is to start financing mobile phones for women so that they can have independence of their bank account. You know, those are issues that are continuous. We take women through eight weeks training. We give them financial training. We meet them on a on a, on a monthly basis. Women also teach each other. And, and that's why the groups, the shamas are important. I wanted to say something about the shamas. Women shamas and men shamas are totally different. I'm a man. Men shamas mainly rotate around financial issues. Women shamas rotate around social issues. Finance is only one of the small things they deal with. There is a lot of training. There's a lot of information that is passed between one age group and the other age group. And within those chamas, you pass knowledge and skill, and you give women an opportunity to know they can also own land, and they can be registered in their name without removing them from the family setup. Because again, if you go the other extreme, then you have introduced a crisis. That's what we do. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have one last question for the panelists. So I'm going to give you a chance to think about it. Rada, I'll come to you too. If you had one piece of policy advice um, related to the gender gap, what would it be? And at the beginning of this conference, we heard about how we're talking about the nexus between research, industry, and policy, right? And, and that's why we're here together and why we're digging um, deeply into these issues. But um, not that question yet. Rada, what did you want to say? 
And if there's any other questions, please um, let the person with the microphone know. I actually had a question for Professor Kusimba. Um, whilst I really like the, this co concept of slow finance, and I think there's some other work that's been done um, to show like when credit can be useful, I found this analogy with fashion uh, not appropriate because fast fashion is cheap fashion, but digital credit and fast finance is not cheap finance. So I think we need to be careful when we make analogies like that because I mean, FSD's own study, when you see the APRs on digital credit, they are not cheap. Uh, so I think we need to avoid that analogy because it automatically assumes that fast finance is cheap finance. Thanks. Um, let's get that question, and then I don't know if Sybil's still online, if she wants to respond, we can come to that. But question first, please. Thank you. Yes, this is uh, Adan Shibia from Kipra. Uh, first, I wish to thank the panelists for the very insightful discussions. I just have one question for Mr. Mwangi. I think at the beginning he highlighted uh, three, um, three um, challenges facing women, issues of financial literacy, general literacy levels, and cultural, uh, cultural biases. Perhaps uh, issues of uh, financial literacy and general, general literacy in my view, could be a bit easier to, to address. Now coming to cultural, uh, cultural barriers or cultural uh, biases, I wanted to hear what would be your advice in terms of how policymakers should uh, approach this issue of uh, cultural, cultural biases. Perhaps um, highlighting from the experience of the Kenya Women Finance, uh, Microfinance Bank, how do you approach it then? Thinking more broadly, what would be a suggestion how, in terms of how should we should think from policy point of view? Thank you very much. I think, um, you know, uh, the country has genuinely to make decisions that the f this 52% of the population need to be put in decision making. Th that we have to decide as a country. Because, and I like what Obama said, he said, any team that prays goes for a football match with 50% of its prayers, we'll just lose. Women, we take girls to school, we educate them, but we discriminate them, even when it comes to the workplace. And the discrimination is not very loud, it's not in paper, it's not in policies, but it is ingrained in the way we do business, even in the workplace. So the first thing to do is that we should remember that women are homemakers, they are the ones who give life, actually. They, all of us are born through that process. And in itself, every time a woman goes on maternity leave for three months and another six months she has to look after her baby, when she comes back to the office, you must remember you can pit her against a man who has been in the office at the, doing the same thing with her. You must, at one point, give some special approach to it and I'm not talking about giving women who are weak a chance, but remembering that a woman is doing much more, even f at the home level, at, by the time you get to the workplace, she should be given more space and, and be given an opportunity to move up. And, and those are deliberate things that have to be done. When we think as a country, those casual biases are at the family level. We started at the family level. When you have a small child, even we, the professionals and the educated people, when you go to buy a doll, what do you buy for your daughter? You buy a doll, you buy a baby, a small baby doll. Then for your son, you buy a car. What are you saying? You are saying to the girl, your work is to give birth. You guy, your work is to be the martial guy who owns assets. So we, we've started it early. This stereotyping are at the family level. We are the ones who do it on a daily basis. And it's not just about kasha. Kasha is dynamic. We can keep changing it. But we need to deliberately put this girl to an equal position as the boy. So we need to remove it at the workplace. We need to remove it at the community level. And we also need to remove it at, at the, end, you know, the financial sector. Because I can tell you that these are challenges that even women who look for loans even in the banks, the first thing 
she can't, she is asked insecurity. The second thing she is asked for the husband to be a guarantor. These are things that are done, and it's a continuous process. Things are not the way they were in the 80s, neither in the 60s, but we need to deliberately keep making policies and laws that are able to guide us in that direction. Thank you. Um, Sybil, if you're still online, did you want to um, comment on Rada's question? Thank you, and thank you, Dektari. I think that's a really excellent um, point. And uh, I think you're right, I probably misspoke when, you know, when we say fast fashion, it, it may appear to us as a consumer to be a, a cheap option. But in fact, fast fashion is very expensive and our world is paying the price for the way uh, fast fashion is produced and distributed. So I think that, you know, in that sense, the analogy could work, but I think you're very right. Uh, fast is not cheap, right? And so that brings even more to the fore, the value of something that is slow. So thank you so much, um, you know, for that correction. I think you're quite right. Thanks, Sybil, and it's nice we got to see you. We didn't see you earlier. Um, great. So uh, let's let's go to the final question. So for each of the panelists, if you could provide one piece of policy advice um, on closing this gender gap, what would it be? Rosemary? As a, a representative of KNBS and provider for official statistics, the first uh, policy recommendation I would make is to provide adequate financing for gender disaggregated data from both the supply side and the demand side so that the policymaker has in their hands information to be able to plan well and to clearly be able to see the direction uh, where we are going. So it is information, it is statistics. Yeah. Can you. I get an amen? No? <laughs> Thank you. I think for me, your guess is as good as mine, that I would like women to be included in the decision-making table. You know, we can't continue doing what we are doing. You know, I keep saying, it takes effort to do the wrong thing. So it doesn't take effort to do the correct thing. The correct thing is include women in decision-making at the household level, in decision making in public sector and in decision making at private sector level. And we should avoid tokenism. We should avoid situations that we are saying we are doing it because it's good to do. The other thing I would say is that women need to cream their space. There's nothing that is given for free. You've got to fight for it. Go for it, women. Fight for it. Thank you. Rada? I'll make my recommendation very specific, and it's actually to financial institutions. And this is both from an observation of data, of the amount of money now glowing, going to the unclaimed financial benefits authority, and also very personal experience recently from a death in the family. Instead of doing CSR, banks, can you ensure and financial institutions, can you ensure that every account either is a joint account or has a very clearly nominated next of kin? They, I, I just don't get it how these millions are going to, to the fi Unclaimed Financial Benefits Authority. Uh, make sure you provide your clients the ability to make a will uh, you know, as, as just a service. Like, I think that would benefit Kenya and the gender gap much, much more than any tree planting CSR that's often done by banks. Thank you. Great. Those are some great policy recommendations. And even if there aren't as many policymakers in the room right now, there's going to be a lot of them here in the morning. So we'll make sure that those are heard loud and clear. Can you please join me in thanking this fantastic panel and the presenters earlier?